These days, carbohydrates are the macronutrient that are most often in the spotlight and getting big headlines, both for positive and negative reasons. But amongst fitness-minded people and athletes, protein has always had the most mystique and hype surrounding it. One reason for this is that the government-issued recommended daily allowance for protein is so low. Decades of research from leading experts in nutrition show that the RDA is well below where it should be, even too low for non-active people, let alone active people. This oversight leaves it up to the individual nutritionists, doctors, and you to determine how much protein you should eat, and the amounts vary widely, to say the least. The low RDA also leads many people to simply conclude that more protein is always better. So let's be clear. Protein isn't magic, and beyond a certain point, eating more of it isn't necessarily going to give you any added benefit. But that point just might be a little higher than most people are currently eating, and protein definitely deserves to be a high nutritional priority, particularly if you are training hard or looking to lose weight. Protein is essential for muscle growth. That much you probably know. But it also factors into numerous other crucial bodily processes, far too many to mention all of them here. But just to mention a few, supporting the immune system, growth and maintenance of muscle, blood clotting, hormone production, and the transport of important nutrients throughout the body. As we discussed in a previous video, protein is also broken down and used as energy, to the tune of four calories per gram. A gram of protein isn't much. It's like a cube of chicken or a quarter of an egg white. And no, all protein isn't the same. There are many different types of proteins, but they're all made up of different combinations of around 20 amino acids that are linked together into a large macromolecule. Proteins, like foods, vary widely in quality based upon their amino acid makeup. If a food containing protein has an adequate amount of the nine so-called essential amino acids, then it's considered a complete protein. Those essential amino acids are ones that human beings need to get from their food and cannot make on their own. Egg protein, for instance, is a complete protein. The protein you get from a bowl of rice, on the other hand, isn't a complete protein on its own because it doesn't have an adequate amount of the amino acid lysine. But add beans to that rice and you have a complete protein. To be clear, this doesn't mean that rice or rice protein is useless, bad for you, or that it doesn't count. It just means you'd have to eat more of it to get the same amount of protein than, say, eggs, and that you'd need to do some more food combining. That is why it is important to get your protein from a range of sources, each with their own unique amino acid profile, particularly if you're a vegetarian. Once we pull back slightly and look at how protein impacts how we feel and perform, it gets a lot more interesting. For instance, Protein has been shown in numerous studies to help boost satiety, or how full you feel. This makes it essential for people who are limiting calories or looking to lose fat and not always feel hungry while they're trying to do it. It is also critical for recovery from exercise and to help physical training translate into athletic performance and physique changes, like adding muscle. So let's dig in and talk more specifically about how this works and how you can dial in protein intake accordingly. Protein needs vary widely by body type and size, goal, and activity level. Still, having a baseline in mind and knowing what that baseline looks like in action can be incredibly helpful. Here's why. When weight loss is the goal, it's a common approach to simply cut calories across the board, rather than only in certain areas. But the research is clear that protein is the one area that you should definitely not be cutting. And even when athletes think that they're getting tons of protein, they're often not eating nearly as much as they think. First, let's discuss that RDA, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, or 0.36 grams per pound. Here's what that means in reality. If you're a 125 pound woman, the RDA standard puts you at just 45 grams of protein, or just a little bit more than a large chicken breast in a day. For a 185 pound man, that's just 66 grams of protein, which is essentially a large chicken breast in a cup of yogurt. That's not enough no matter your activity level, and luckily, Almost everyone is already eating more than that. A more research-supported guideline is a minimum of 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight for everyone, or 0.6 grams per pound. At the low end, for a 125-pound woman, that's around 78 grams of protein, or about the equivalent of two eggs for breakfast, a tuna sandwich for lunch, a protein-rich snack or a small protein shake, a chicken breast with dinner. For a 185-pound man, the same minimum standard comes out to 116 grams of protein, or the equivalent of 
three eggs for breakfast, a protein-rich snack, a tuna sandwich for lunch, a post-workout protein shake, and a chicken breast with dinner. That might seem like a surprising amount of food, and it doesn't even make any mention of all the veggies, and high-fiber carbs, and fats that may go along with that protein. But looking at it, you can see how meeting that standard would help keep someone who's dieting feel full. It would also help someone who is training hard stay fueled up, well-recovered, and able to perform well. And remember, that's the minimum. There's a case that anyone who's training hard for sport or for weight training regularly should aim for the upper range, upwards of 2 grams per kilo or about 1 gram per pound of body weight. That's like adding another protein-heavy snack or shake to the sample days that we just discussed. Plus, maybe another egg for breakfast. What about beyond that? There are definitely plenty of people in the strength and bodybuilding community who push their intake well beyond 2 grams per kilogram. And recent research by our colleague Dr. Jose Antonio and others support that this is safe, carrying no risk of kidney damage or bone mineral loss for a healthy person, as was once thought. It is safe, but is it necessary? More research seems to say no. Even if it's not hurting, it may not be helping enough to justify the cost, expense, and possible stomach aches. Plus, past a certain point, each gram of protein you're taking in also means you'll have less room on your plate and in your stomach for fiber and nutrient-rich plants and other foods. Suffice it to say, you should be ensuring that you are consistently eating enough protein from a variety of sources. If that foundation isn't enough for your lifestyle, then you can further customize it from there. When trying to meet a somewhat ambitious protein target, it can be tempting to get fixated on the details. How many grams of protein per meal, how many meals per day, where those meals fall into relation to training, and your life schedule. Does that stuff matter? Sure, to a certain degree, but before you start setting protein alarms for the middle of the night, press pause for a moment. The existing research indicates that timing-related considerations should be a lower priority than just getting the right amount of total calories and enough total protein throughout the day. However, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have any timing strategy in mind. Here's why. If you're aiming for the high-end standard of 2 gram per kilogram of protein, eating all of that protein in just a meal or two is going to be a tall order. Even if you can do it, you probably can't do it consistently and probably won't make you feel good. This on its own is a solid argument for breaking it up into at least three or four smaller meals throughout the day, plus a snack or a protein shake if needed. If you'd like a number to aim for, the low end per meal should be at least 20 grams and more like 30 if you're highly active. This has been shown to be the minimum amount needed to optimize what is known as muscle protein synthesis, or the process by which your muscles repair and grow. The upper end is more likely 40 grams. Any higher than that and you're talking about a seriously large meal. Speaking of that post-workout shake, is it just a bodybuilder cliche or is there value in it? To be clear, the protein in a whey shake isn't any better quality than the equivalent amount from, say, eggs or yogurt. It has just three real advantages. One, convenience. Two, it's relatively low volume, meaning you may be able to eat again soon. Three, it's also extra hydration when you need it most. If you're striving to take in more protein than you're accustomed to, those are big benefits. Animal-derived protein sources like eggs, meat, and dairy products are the best-known sources of protein, and they're the ones that set the bar when it comes to the amino acid profiles and the scale of protein quality. Does this mean that you should only prioritize those proteins or only count them if you're going to measure your intake? Not necessarily. It just means that you need to eat less of these proteins compared to vegetable sources to get a full range of amino acids. And yes, a diet rich in the highest quality proteins has been shown in research to carry over to gains in strength and muscle, training performance, and body composition. But as we discussed earlier, they are definitely not the only sources of protein that most of us eat or that we should eat. Plants and grains of all types contain protein in varying degrees. No, they don't quite match up to animal products from a pure protein perspective, but they definitely can support muscle growth. But if you're a vegetarian or vegan, or if you're just looking to get your protein from a wide variety of sources, which is a great idea, then you should be aware of how to create a complete protein from what are known as complementary proteins. As we discussed earlier, beans on their own aren't a complete protein. Neither is rice but beans and rice together form a complete protein. 
Here are some other common complementary protein pairings. Beans and corn or wheat tortillas, rice and lentils, pea soup with bread or crackers, garbanzo beans with tahini, pasta with beans, or peanut butter on bread. The difference may not be as big as you believe. Studies have found that pure rice protein produced similar athletic and strength gains as whey when the protein was used with a well-designed strength training program. We don't want you to leave these videos feeling like you need to start measuring and counting everything you eat, calories, carbs, proteins, and on down the line. But if you're going to count anything, it should probably be protein. Even if you only do it for a month or so, just to the point where you know what it feels like to prepare and eat at a consistent high level, it may be worth your time. Here's why. A substantial amount of research has concluded that when protein intake is the same in various diets, the fat loss and body composition changes are nearly identical. In action, this means that once you have your protein at a sufficient level, there's room for you to customize the other elements in your diet based upon taste and preferences. As our colleague, Dr. Jose Antonio, recently put it on the Bodybuilding.com podcast, it's very difficult to get fat if the only thing you overfeed on is protein. The takeaway for you, when you've got a consistent, solid approach to nutritional and training strategies, there's probably no downside to pushing the protein up. <laughs>